The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our first webinar in our new associate member webinar series, Applications of Non-Destructive Testing in Concrete Construction, put on for us today by F Prime C Solutions, Inc. So my name is Camille Richet. I'm the Office Manager with Concrete Ontario, and I will be your facilitator today, along with Oliver Sow, who is our Technical Service Engineer and is going to be helping me run the webinar today and helping out with the questions portion a little bit later on. I'm very excited to give you all a chance to connect with our associate members and learn more about some of the products and services that they specialize in and the opportunities that they present for the concrete industry. So just to go over a few housekeeping items here, the webinar is going to be approximately 40 to 45 minutes long. Uh, we'll have a question and answer period at the end, followed by a Kahoot pop quiz. So we'll be able to see how well everyone was paying attention and everyone's got the opportunity to win some pretty great prizes. Uh, all of the participants are muted. If you do have any questions, please use the questions pane in the GoToWebinar, and Oliver will be monitoring those and we'll be following up with those at the end. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and posted on our website, so you can always access it there, as well as all of the webinars in this series will be posted in the same format. So now I would like to introduce you to our presenter. So Dr. Hamid Lacey is the co-founder and structural engineer with F Prime C Solutions Inc. F Prime C is a technology company specialized in advanced non-destructive testing and evaluation of concrete materials and structures. Over the past 15 years, Hamid has sorry, Hamid has been heavily involved in the concrete industry as a professional engineer and researcher. He has an extensive academic background in structural evaluation, inspection, and repair of concrete structures. Hamid holds a PhD from McGill University, was ranked among the top 150 researchers in Canada in 2018, and received the 2018 Entrepreneurship Award from the Professional Engineers of Ontario Ottawa Chapter. How are you doing today, Hamid? No, I'm, doing, uh, I'm doing excellent, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present for Concrete Ontario today. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here with us. Uh, I'm sure you're eager to get started, so I'm going to pass you the controls, and uh, we can begin. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, our webinar on non-destructive testing for concrete construction. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. And uh, I'm going to uh, briefly uh, overview some of the advantages and benefits that non-destructive testing can offer for uh, our industry. The uh, agenda for this presentation is uh, pretty uh, simple and straightforward. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to briefly uh, overview uh, why we do need a proper quality control and quality assurance uh, plan in the first place. Uh, some of the documents and guidelines that often uh, is used by uh, concrete professionals. And uh, in the second section, which is the uh, main uh, focus of this presentation, is where I'm going to talk about the applications of non-destructive testing for uh, quality control and quality assurance. Uh, we will uh, also share some of the applications on and off the field and later uh, towards the end of this presentation I'll leave uh, time for question and answer uh, which will be facilitated by Concrete Ontario. Let's uh, start by uh, standards and guidelines so we are we are living in a very regulated uh, industry everything uh, has been standardized over the past hundred years we have lots and tons of documents uh, uh, referring to different aspects of uh, quality control and quality assurance uh, all tender documents that we have today uh, somehow uh, implement and incorporate some sort of uh, basic uh, quality control procedure for concrete but believe it or not, we have been in many, many projects over the past few years since establishing F-Prime-C uh, that uh, 
with all the precautions and uh, great practices that we implement, uh, we all have uh, bad days. And uh, those are the areas that uh, I'm going to uh, get the focus of this presentation on and how NDT can actually uh, complement uh, what we already have in place. So as an overview, we have uh, CSA documents for concrete materials and methods of concrete construction, and then best practices for concrete placement, planning, field testing, and sampling. So all these uh, uh, documents basically are uh, there to help contractors and uh, people involved in concrete construction to deliver uh, a better quality concrete at the end of the project. Then for the second portion of this presentation, I have three documents I just uh, have missed to place the last one here, uh, which is uh, more towards the non-destructive testing for quality, con uh, quality control of concrete. The, the document on this uh, second that uh, you see guidelines on non-destructive testing of concrete structures, this is by International Atomic Energy. It's quite old document, but uh, it's still very relevant and nothing really uh, fundamentally has changed uh, in terms of like the technologies introduced in this uh, guideline. Uh, it's just like improvement of uh, what, what has been developed uh, and continually uh, improved over the past 20 years uh, since uh, being introduced. And uh, last but not least, and uh, the missing part is the ACI document, uh, which I will uh, introduce later uh, in, in the presentation. So these are going to be the core of uh, uh, the documents that uh, are uh, used uh, by F'C and other uh, companies involved in the NDT-based quality control of concrete. Now, why we ran into problems? Uh, with all the uh, care that we uh, have uh, in our practice, uh, there are time to time and depending on where we are making concrete, uh, we, we ran into different problems. For example, in, in uh, uh, Persian Gulf area, we, we ran into contaminated water, saline water, chloride uh, is always one of the challenges. So uh, pre having access to proper water is, is a key uh, thing here. Alkali aggregate reactions, uh, this is uh, something that we have had uh, many issues in the past in Canada and, and US uh, and uh, hopefully these days uh, this is pretty much under control. Uh, presence of sulfides uh, preet, preet problem uh, has been a continuous problem in, in Quebec area. We, we have been to sites uh, where this has caused like uh, serious problems in the past. And uh, this is one of the areas that can affect quality of the end uh, constructed facilities. Then uh, we do have uh, problems that arise from uh, the errors that we have in uh, concrete uh, practice, uh, in uh, construction practice. Uh, when we want to adjust uh, the water content uh, in concrete and adding extra water uh, to the mixers at, uh, right on the site. So this, has, uh, this should be something uh, that is uh, uh, that needs to be precisely supervised by uh, concrete supplier. Inadequate consolidation is uh, again one of the problems that we have. Poor thermal practices, which means like when, when we are concreting in the cold uh, season, we just forget or ignore uh, proper uh, insulation of concrete, proper coverings, proper heating. And uh, this can actually cause uh, cracking in concrete, uh, like a very uh, un substandard uh, concrete strength, and this is something that uh, needs to be taken into account. In the air, in the other areas of construction, such as deep foundations, we are still uh, struggling to convince contractors to switch to tremi pile con uh, construction. Uh, when we are dealing with uh, deep foundations. Uh, so this is, uh, this is something that can affect the quality and integrity of uh, the drilled shafts. With regards to quality control, uh, we always want to know which parties are involved. And it's pretty much everyone in, in, uh, in, in this business are involved in the quality of the end product. Uh, so from the regulator, by, by having uh, standards and uh, guidelines specified in the technical documents, suppliers, general contractors, subcontractors, the owner, 
And then finally, in the construction and design, we have the structural engineers, testing agency, people who are responsible for doing the test, and also uh, architects. Uh, these parties are all like uh, working closely with each other at different steps of construction design and design and construction practice. And uh, this collaboration ensures that uh, concrete uh, will uh, concrete construction will have adequate uh, adequate uh, quality and integrity. So right now we have like uh, many tests in place, uh, slump test and uh, air content is a standard test for like fresh concrete. Then we do have a uh, unit weight of concrete and uh, strength of concrete. In more specific cases, uh, the owners uh, may, may specify some special tests such as rapid chloride permeability test. But today I'm here to talk about uh, more advanced features and more like uh, non-destructive testing that might be needed uh, when uh, things go wrong. And here is uh, some examples when uh, things can go wrong. Uh, in the left section, uh, you see a concrete uh, wall in a very, uh, very important concrete facility here in uh, uh, Bowmanville. And, and you see like with all the cares that we have uh, taken into account, uh, we ran into bad days. We have poor consolidation. And the, the reason is not like a bad practice. It, it was just a bad luck. Uh, the concrete pump was broken, uh, like when, when the temperatures were around minus 20. And that was just enough uh, for the, the, the delays caused by this uh, was just enough to uh, make the concrete having a poor consolidation. And the second one, uh, you see a concrete lift where a uh, miscalculation in the setting time of concrete resulted in a very serious uh, cold uh, joints uh, between the two lifts. And you see like cold joints, which uh, often are like very minor problems, can easily turn into something very severe. This is about like 20, 25 centimeter uh, core verifies that uh, this cold joint is pretty much serious. It goes through the thickness and uh, can affect structural integrity. And th these uh, situations are where like uh, all contractors, the structural engineers and the owners uh, get into big trouble. Another example of where things can go wrong is the construction of deep foundations, uh, especially with deep foundations is that where uh, you don't have any sign of visual defects, uh, uh, you, you have only access to the top of the foundation, uh, you will find yourself like having built uh, second piles like this, uh, which uh, do not provide uh, the satisfactory structural performance and they do not provide uh, reliable uh, structural integrity or durability that is uh, needed. We have seen examples of this uh, problem in Montreal where like uh, water was flooding from the second vault into the construction site, delaying the project for several weeks and uh, causing uh, lots, of, uh, lots of costs uh, to, the, to the project. On the right hand side, this is a condominium tower in uh, Toronto area with all the cares and uh, excellent practice that was uh, was was there you you still see like uh, uh, when when you uh, when you your uh, post tensioning is premature, uh, you are going to put too much uh, too much stress on concrete and uh, creating cracks in concrete elements that are uh, going to affect uh, the structural properties of these uh, critical members. And uh, you, you have to implement and repair these elements at this early stage. Now, uh, when things go wrong, people uh, start thinking about taking course, taking course. And as, uh, as you see here, like uh, uh, written down by structural engineers and, uh, uh, and the contractor itself, do not drill. This is, this is a post-tensioned uh, huge girder and it's a very critical element in the load carrying system. And uh, there is no way that we want to risk it all and uh, take cores and suddenly uh, accidentally uh, cut those uh, post-tensioning wires. And uh, this is going to be a catastrophic uh, uh, event. So we want to see what non-destructive has, has to offer in such cases. 
Non-destructive testing methods for quality control are uh, categorized in dif different groups based on the physical concept uh, behind the technology. There are mechanical methods such as rebound hammer. You might have seen this uh, more often because this is the this is the basically first in line uh, for quality uh, control, uh, a rebound hammer or a Schmidt hammer test. Then we do have pull out test. Acoustic methods such as ultrasonic testing uh, with its variations, uh, ultrasonic pulse velocity, ultrasonic pulse echo tomography, uh, or impact echo. This, this, this is a very uh, important category for evaluating uh, structural uh, quality and integrity of concrete materials. Then we do have electromagnetic method and electrical methods. Oops. Sorry, I just lost the presenter. Yeah. And then we do have thermal methods such as maturity method, which is becoming uh, more uh, more common these days. And electrochemical methods. This is not really concerning uh, new construction, but but again, it's one of the most commonly used when when corrosion is in uh, uh, is the source of concern. Guidelines for concrete, as you see here, this is the third missing document uh, from the American Concrete Institute report on non-destructive test methods for evaluation of concrete. Uh, this is again a very good document. Topics are pretty much old and outdated, but uh, still uh, as a reference method, nothing has changed like dramatically in, in NDT over the past uh, two decades. How can NDT help? So these, these methods can help uh, assess quality and uniformity of concrete. If there are certain cases where we do have cracking, uh, these methods can help identify uh, crack depth and uh, verify uh, quality at cold joints. Uh, when we do have a sub substandard concrete strength and we do not have the option of taking concrete cores and testing uh, cores, uh, we have like uh, NDT practices that are pretty much accurate for, for estimating in place strength of concrete. Then when structural integrity is that uh, is, is the question, uh, we do have a series of uh, NDT uh, methods uh, based on ultrasonic testing uh, that can help us assess integrity of those elements. Uh, when uh, piles and deep foundations are concerned, this is a this is a great industry like geotechnical. They, they have been like very forward thinking in implementing NDT. And I think structural engineers also need to follow uh, geotechnical engineers in this domain. Uh, they, they are very much uh, uh, into technicality of things. Uh, methods have been developed um, and, and are being developed for evaluating uh, the quality in these elements. And uh, it's especially true because with deep foundations, you normally have only access to the top of these foundations. So you have to be creative enough and uh, uh, go there with, uh, with uh, accurate solutions that can help you uh, assess the quality of the built environment. And then durability is becoming uh, more of a challenge, uh, so especially like in countries like uh, Canada and in Ontario, where uh, we are not like uh, having the, the great uh, weather uh, for uh, for a large portion of the year, and we have to cope with uh, environmental effects of uh, cold season. Uh, it's pretty much uh, important to have tools that help us uh, to evaluate durability performance of concrete. Now we are going to head into the second section of this presentation where I am going to go uh, through some of the case studies and at the same time I'm talking about the methods that uh, are being used for quality control of concrete. The right image actually shows the concrete wall that I earlier showed you. So you see uh, when things go wrong and we do have a bad day, uh, the second thing that we want to do is uh, evaluate uh, the extent of defects and the severity of defects. We want to know if uh, these defects are locally or they are going to impact the uh, performance of uh, the overall structure. So this is a very important concrete facility and uh, the asset owner was interested to know, uh, and especially structural engineering team, they, they wanted to know if uh, the constructed concrete has uh, adequate uh, durability performance uh, uh, to, to withstand the design uh, criteria. And uh, the NDT solutions that we proposed, uh, a combination of uh, ultrasonic testing and rebound hammer, uh, was able to uh, evaluate uh, where 
the poor areas of concrete are located. So uh, if uh, the decision is to remove poor quality concrete and replace it with uh, new concrete, uh, contractors are often very interested to minimize, minimize the area that requires repair because nobody really wants to damage a, a brand new structure. So uh, the smaller the area that requires repair, uh, the uh, the better uh, and uh, here you know, we we use the uh, ultrasonic pulse velocity testing and uh, rebound hammer testing uh, to verify areas that have poor quality concrete uh, and low low strength uh, concrete and this helped actually contract or with limiting the area that required chipping and uh, effective repair. Another area that is uh, quite interesting for uh, concrete construction area is uh, quality control of cold joints. So uh, this this often happens in in in, in Canada where, where we are concreting in cold season and uh, we are using that mixture. There are time to time where we have miscalculations with regards to the setting time of like a first lift, and when the second lift comes, uh, then uh, creates uh, creates uh, cold joints that might end up being uh, being uh, lousy and uh, require a better inspection. So if you are ever concerned about uh, the quality of concrete on around the cold joint areas, uh, ultrasonic pulse velocity uh, offers uh, excellent combination and configuration. So you can test it in uh, direct position, indirect position, and semi-direct. So depending on uh, what are the accesses, if you have access to the both side of the elements, or it is the access only to, the, to one side of the element, is this technique is going to uh, help uh, contractors assess the quality. Uh, if you want to know how the technique works, it's pretty much simple. And on the top uh, section, you will see a good quality concrete. The distance between the two electrodes are pretty much uh, constant uh, in both case scenarios. In a good quality concrete, the wave always travels the shortest distance. So the X is going to be the smallest. Uh, and uh, uh, sorry, sorry, the, the, uh, for the given X, uh, the, the travel time will be shorter. So the velocity that you get for uh, ultrasonic pulse is going to be larger. So the, the better the quality of concrete, the higher the ultrasonic pulse velocity. Now, if you have a poor quality concrete with cracks or like honeycombs, uh, then the travel distance uh, uh, the same, uh, but the time it's going to be much larger. So it's going to be reduced speed. So poor quality concrete means uh, reduced uh, speed of uh, ultrasonic pulse. Now, how this translates, uh, we can use uh, codes like ASDMC uh, 597 uh, last updated in 2016. Uh, this is uh, this is basically going to help engineers assess the ultrasonic pulse velocity in concrete. Now there are different uh, methods. You can do this on concrete cylinders, which is the most ideal scenario. But uh, in cases where you don't have access to concrete cylinders anymore uh, and you want to assess the quality of concrete in the field, you have to use techniques such as uh, direct and indirect methods in the field. And now you see when, when you have excellent quality concrete, you are expecting uh, wave velocities in the order of magnitude of 4,500 meters per second. Uh, where you have poor quality concrete and it is about like 2,000 to 3,000 meters per second. So the, you, just to give you an idea, uh, there are different tables, different benchmarks have been developed over years and you can use uh, uh, ones that are more appropriate and more closer to your type of facilities. Then uh, one of the most famous uh, methods that uh, most contractors uh, might have seen is the is the rebound hammer. Rebound hammer testing uh, is one of the oldest like uh, methods around in concrete inspection and testing. The hammer itself can uh, provide information about uniformity of concrete. So when you have large concrete slabs, uh, large concrete wall structures, and you want to verify quality across this large area. Rebound hammers provide an excellent choice for assessing this uniformity. 
Moreover, if you are interested to uh, get an idea about the strength of concrete, uh, more advanced hammers that are available in the market uh, these days can actually uh, offer you uh, more realistic information about the class of strength. So with regards to strength of concrete, people think uh, whatever they read from their uh, hammer can directly be translated into concrete strength. This is a very old school practice and uh, it has proved to be uh, inaccurate in many cases. So engineers and developers of these technologies has, have improved things over the past uh, two decades. And uh, now we do have uh, different standards such as uh, EN standard, uh, which can be helping uh, engineers basically in uh, assessing uh, strength more uh, precisely uh, using the same uh, documents and tools. A uh, rebound hammer test uh, can be combined with ultrasonic pulse uh, to provide uh, an in-place concrete strength. This is very exciting because we have helped with uh, uh, different uh, challenging projects uh, across Canada uh, with this solution. Uh, we have been in uh, concrete construction uh, facilities that uh, the owner uh, didn't allow taking any concrete cores. So when you don't have any cylinders left for testing uh, the strength of concrete and you don't have any uh, permission to uh, drill into concrete, uh, then these NDT solutions are great uh, practices. Uh, you can achieve accuracies of up to 90% uh, when, when the uh, information database uh, is, is pretty much uh, complete. Uh, you, you can always uh, calibrate this for higher higher uh, precision, uh, but even without calibration, uh, you can get a sense of uh, the classification of concrete strength. Here is one of the examples that we used uh, for another concrete wall. Uh, as you see uh, on the left picture, we have a very huge concrete wall and we wanted to verify uniformity and strength uh, in different areas of this concrete wall. So we tested on a regular and systematic grid uh, and on each group we performed uh, ultrasonic test and Schmidt hammer test and uh, the measurements turned out for uh, both techniques. So on the top you see ultrasonic pulse velocity measurements, how they how it is varying across different across the area. And in the lower section, we do have the rebound hammer. Now these two results can be combined with each other uh, to provide uh, concrete strength. I have a slide, uh, a few slides uh, later, uh, and I'll, I'll show you how this is going to basically work. Now the uh, another topic was the cold joint. I talked about this earlier. As you see, you can use ultrasonic pulse velocity to uh, evaluate the extent of uh, this crack, the severity of cracks. So if you ever run into such problems, non-destructive testing can help you evaluate the depth of these cracks uh, and uh, how serious they are. Uh, cracks might happen due to like uh, premature uh, pre-stressing of the elements. So in, in, in this case, if you want to see if these cracks are just like uh, uh, surface cracks or they are like uh, affecting the structural integrity of concrete, uh, NDT methods can, can help you find the extent and severity of these cracks as well. The basic guideline for uh, crack width and uh, crack depth uh, based on ACI document, uh, you, you will see on table uh, 4.1 uh, how these cracks can uh, be uh, accepted for different types of exposure. So the, the harsh, uh, the, more, uh, the, the more severe the exposure condition is, uh, then uh, you, you, you will be in uh, you, the, the, the guidelines and the restrictions will be tight. With regards to concrete strength, and this is pretty much a, a, a continuous challenge over the cold season, uh, low breaks uh, when, when you don't have any more concrete cylinders to test uh, what, what, what can be done. And uh, as I said earlier, we can do two, two different methods. Uh, one is the maturity method that is uh, good for real-time monitoring, but this is only good for real-time monitoring. If, if you ran out of the, the first uh, couple of weeks of concrete, like first 28 days, uh, then there is really no point in uh, continuing the maturity test and you will need uh, like a, a more accurate test just to confirm and verify the strength of concrete. 
uh, for in-place estimating of concrete strength, uh, you can use a combination of uh, ultrasonic pulse velocity and rebound hammer as explained earlier. Uh, there are two standard practices in North America. We are using ACI 2281R uh, practice to evaluate uh, in-place concrete strength. And in Europe, uh, Euronorm uh, 13791, this is recently updated and uh, it provides excellent method. I think ACI is going to follow this procedure uh, sometime uh, soon. And uh, this is basically how engineers can use a very cost-effective framework to uh, evaluate uh, concrete strength, especially when the area is large. An example is here, there is a footing in uh, Pickering, Ontario. As you see, we do on the footing area, we do the rebound hammer test on the left, and then we do the ultrasonic pulse in semi-direct method on the, on the right. The results are combined in a mathematical model, and you can evaluate concrete strength uh, across different areas. And the results are pretty much uh, uh, accurate. If you really want to verify strength of concrete, find areas that are substandard, for example, this red area, uh, you can always use this the method for the purpose of verification. Large slabs, this is a uh, critical facility in Bowmanville again, and uh, this was about uh, 400 square meter concrete slab uh, frozen uh, right after, uh, right after uh, the construction and the contractor was interested to know how the cold weather uh, has affected the setting and hardening of concrete, uh, especially near the shorings uh, on the edges. Uh, we, we did have like problems because those were areas where uh, windy condition had, had removed the, uh, the covering and installation from concrete and had uh, created uh, areas where concrete had frozen and didn't have proper setting and hardening. And this method was actually helped to uh, identify areas that were affected. Uh, so instead of like uh, removing the entire slab, uh, the repair procedure was just uh, limited to areas that really uh, experienced this uh, harsh condition. Another area that NDT can help uh, contractors is to verify structural details. Uh, so if you, if you have a concrete slab and then you want to install uh, a steel structure on top of it and uh, it involves like uh, drilling and uh, putting the anchor bolts, uh, you want to avoid cutting steel rebar. So uh, these are situations uh, where rebar scanning uh, like GPR can be used. Uh, another technique that can be used is eddy current. Uh, this is also great. Uh, it can identify the rebar size and uh, especially for uh, parts of the world where uh, like there is more concern that uh, contractors are performing substandard work. Uh, these two techniques can be combined to uh, verify the location of steel bars to uh, locate areas of conduits and buried components, evaluate uh, proper concrete thickness and uh, uh, do the evaluate the overall thickness measurement for concrete elements that have only one side access like a tunnel lining, for example. Uh, this is an example again in Toronto area where we were like testing a concrete slab uh, and uh, near the shoring uh, there was an area where accumulation of ice and snow uh, had uh, created a void in a, in a very critical uh, concrete slab on grade and uh, the contractor was interested to know if this is just something local on the near to the shoring or this is something that happens in other areas of the slab combination of uh, ground penetrating radar and uh, ultrasonic pulse tomography was used to to evaluate the uh, integrity of concrete so these are a very good combination to assess the quality and integrity in concrete slabs as you see on the right side you will see the uh, uh, ground penetrating radar technique and on the left it is uh, ultrasonic pulse uh, eco eco testing and uh, what happens these two tests when combined together uh, they can uh, they can help engineers in identifying uh, subsurface defects so for example if you have a void if you have an opening uh, inside concrete or if there is an area with uh, like a, a honeycombed uh, concrete uh, these techniques can be used to identify those areas more accurately uh, this helps localize uh, and uh, quantify the extent of uh, these defects. 
So one of the advantages is that it, it reduces the repair cost. So instead of like going aggressively and removing a big chunk of uh, constructed concrete, you can actually localize uh, what needs to be improved and repaired after uh, construction is, is done. And the durability checks, this is, uh, this is particularly interesting because uh, we ran into projects, uh, especially those uh, e uh, exposed facilities, uh, that we want to make sure the concrete has adequate uh, durability performance. Tests such as surface electrical resistivity can easily uh, replace old practice such as RCP test. Uh, this is a more accurate test. I have a great publication on this uh, in uh, Magazine of Concrete, uh, American Concrete Institute. Uh, if you want, uh, you can actually download the document and uh, it provides a very comprehensive review of the applications that uh, electric surface electrical resistivity has uh, to estimate the resistance of concrete against aggressive agents. So when your concrete is exposed to uh, critical agents such as chloride uh, or like uh, freezing and thawing, you want to make sure like uh, your durability performance is satisfactory, then surface electrical resistivity is one of the tests that can help engineers. With this, I'm getting to the last uh, section, uh, last use cases of NDT, and that is for deep foundations. Uh, over the past uh, three years, uh, we have been helping uh, many contractors in deep foundations area, and uh, this is a very interesting topic, especially in uh, in Ottawa and uh, in uh, Toronto area, where lots of construction is happening these days in Montreal as well. And the low strain pile integrity testing and cross hull sonic logging are the two uh, great methods for quality con quality control of concrete uh, uh, piles and shafts. So these two can provide a very cost effective framework for uh, having a quality control in place for deep foundations. Low strain uh, pile integrity testing is very uh, easy to perform. Uh, the interpretation of test results might be uh, trickier and requires a very knowledgeable uh, expert and uh, engineer. Cross hole uh, sonic logging uh, requires like uh, pre planning, uh, installing uh, steel tubes, uh, access tubes uh, before uh, pouring concrete. Uh, but uh, the interpretation of test results is more, is more accurate and uh, it is not dependent on the length of the pile. You can go as long as your pile goes. And this is, uh, this is uh, very, very much, I would say, the standard test procedure for quality control of uh, deep foundations. And uh, you can always consult our engineers uh, with uh, which option will be the best one for your concrete practice. There is another group of tests, thermal integrity profiling, which is again an excellent procedure for uh, deep foundation drill shaft where the two other test methods cannot provide satisfactory results. We have done this for many condominium projects, bridge uh, projects across Ontario, the lowest strain uh, integrity test, uh, and it provides information about major defects in the drill shafts, and it is very rapid and cost effective. Uh, there are some uh, conditions that uh, makes it difficult to interpret the test result. It doesn't provide information about the load bearing capacity, so sometimes contractors are asking about the capacity of the pile. None of these two techniques uh, is actually capable of delivering those information. For those you need more advanced tests such as uh, uh, pile dynamic analysis. Uh, and uh, for uh, low strain test, you need information about the pile depth. So you have to have access to construction records and documents to have proper interpretation of the test results. CSL, cross hole sonic logging, uh, on the other hand, uh, requires pre-installing access tubes. This might, might add to the initial cost of the quality control, but the test results are, are more uh, reliable and uh, uh, useful, and interpretation is much easier uh, when compared to a, com a, a method such as uh, in integrity test with the lowest strain method. This can help identify major defects. Uh, it's also great because it can also identify the extent of defects. So 
you can uh, localize the defect. You know, for example, I, in, in depth from 10 meter to 12 meter, there is an area that you have void or gap. So you can actually uh, go with a more surgical like method for repair and improvement of those foundations. And uh, a test, uh, because it is an uh, ultrasonic pulse and it's passing through the bulk of concrete, it is not affected by soil conditions, whereas a low strain test is uh, very much affected by the soil. And uh, there are some limitations. Again, it doesn't provide any information on pile capacity and uh, no information is provided about uh, concrete beyond the cage. And uh, that is the area where we normally have the problem. If you had seen this uh, photo here, uh, you see like uh, most of the problems that you have is the area that concrete hasn't passed uh, like through the steel cage and you want to make sure you have tools that are capable of doing that for you. With that, I would like to bring uh, this presentation to conclusion. Uh, the objective was to show you how non-destructive testing methods can help contractors and uh, construction professionals uh, with a better quality control and quality assurance, especially when uh, regular QC, QA methods such as uh, concrete breaking and uh, sampling uh, doesn't really deliver uh, the desired uh, precision uh, for uh, ensuring the performance. When intrusive testing is not an option, uh, there are critical facilities that are being built in nuclear, in uh, hydropower, uh, in uh, other sectors like mines, uh, where, where you absolutely don't want to uh, drill a hole into a newly built concrete element. So this is where NDT can actually help uh, contractors. NDT methods can also be used to verify uniformity, strength, and uh, also assess the quality and integrity of concrete on or around concrete cracks. Some of these methods are great for uh, evaluating strength, uh, such as a rebound hammer. Some of them are great for assessing uh, concrete durability, such as uh, methods for basically ultrasonic pulse velocity. Uh, some techniques uh, have proven to be excellent choice for uh, identifying structural details, uh, methods such as ground penetrating radar or GPR. And uh, some great methods are, uh, are there for deep foundations, such as uh, low strain pile integrity testing and uh, cross hull sonic logging for uh, deep foundations. So uh, this is pretty much uh, uh, the presentation for today. I hope you have enjoyed and have picked up some at least uh, keywords on uh, NDT for concrete construction. Thank you very much for uh, attending this webinar and thank you Concrete Ontario for having us uh, for your first session in uh, 2021. I hope everybody is safe and doing great. Uh, thanks and I'll give it back to you. Okay, thank you so much, Hamid. Uh, we're going to trouble you to answer a few questions that uh, have been coming in throughout the presentation. So, Oliver? Sure. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Hamid, for the presentation. Uh, so, looking up here, we do have quite a few questions. Uh, first one, uh, if UPV testing uh, shows low velocity and implies for poor quality concrete, how do you know what exactly is the problem, whether it's a honey pumping or cracks, etc.? So what, what was the question again? Uh, if we do a UPV, what? Second, let me switch to a better sound here. So the question is, if UPV testing shows low velocity and implies for poor quality concrete, how do you determine exactly uh, what's the exact problem? Whether it's a void, crack, honeycombing, uh, how can you determine what's the problem? 
Okay, that that's uh, that's uh, that's a very good question. Basically, so some of these techniques are just uh, diagnosis techniques. Okay, so for example, uh, when you do uh, an X-ray, uh, when you go to a doctor and you do an X-ray, uh, they might see something uh, anomaly, uh, some anomalies in your X-ray. Okay, in your chest X-ray, but they are not really sure if uh, this is uh, this is what they are, uh, and uh, they they send you for CAT scan. Okay, and or like for an MRI. Uh, to uh, better identify what the problem might be. Uh, this is again a very, very much similar with uh, concrete. So sometimes uh, some techniques such as UPV are great in showing that there is a problem, but they are not very effective in showing what the problem might be, okay? Uh, so that is one of the limitations with uh, UPV and that is why uh, I'm always like encouraging people who are involved in this practice to gather the information from different aspects. So we have to see the construction records, we have to see the pictures, we have to see the test results. Uh, depending on the case, we might, we might uh, uh, like ask for additional NDT testing. For example, let's do uh, like a GPR, for example. Let's do an impact echo testing. So these, these might be able to help like uh, limit the area of like a diagnosis. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we might we might need a deep surgery to 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 find uh, uh, what the real problem is. Like if it is like freezing and thawing, if it is like uh, honeycombing, if it is like pool consolidation. Uh, this, the, but at least we know where to go and where to look. Thank you so much. Uh, next question. How many rebound hammer tests should you perform on each area of the concrete that you're testing? So now with, with NDT, uh, especially with uh, rebound hammer, uh, like a common uh, common misunderstanding is that like we, we can go and we, uh, we place the hammer on single location and do the test. Uh, this, this is not 100% wrong, but it is also not the best practice. So, Imagine like uh, this beautiful setup that we see on uh, on the screen below. Uh, we want to verify uh, concrete in different areas here. So the best thing is to have a systematic plan. So what we normally do, we divide this area to a regular grid. Depending on size, you can always go with a very fine, uh, uh, very fine and uh, smaller grid spacing, which adds to the cost of inspection, uh, but but provides more uh, fine and uh, higher resolution image. At each test point, uh, the standard for uh, Schmidt Hammer testing uh, requires you to do at least ten impacts. So you have to take uh, the ten impacts. You have to take a look at the results, and uh, if uh, you have to take the average. If uh, more than two of those readings are more than six units uh, far away from the average, then you have to discard that uh, particular reading and do another one in another location. Uh, so uh, the 10 is for each test location, but if you really want to do uh, test this entire area, I would say every half a meter or every meter, uh, you want to repeat the test. And then you have a map uh, of uh, different variation at each test point, you do 10 readings. And now you are in a position that you have uh, better uh, information about the uniformity of concrete. Thank you, Hamid. Next question is, uh, what will be the best NDT method for assessing 30 meter high columns in a structure exposed to vibration from a centrifuge that is mounted on the top of that structure. Okay, that's uh, and and what is uh, like uh, what is at stake here? Yeah, you want to see like structural integrity, for example. We can assume that. <laughs> okay, uh, so if, uh, so uh, we really have to see what is the objective here. Okay, so if you really want to uh, like scan concrete for. Uh, micro cracks, you have to go with like very precise methods such as uh, seismic tomography. I didn't present that here because that is more of an advanced feature, uh, but uh, methods such as ultrasonic uh, pulse tomography might be able to verify some of the aspects. Uh, if you have access to the top of foundation, uh, uh, top of these columns, uh, 
there might be a chance to perform low strain testing, but uh, because you say there is a centrifuge and I assume that should be a very heavy superstructure, I don't think that's going to be a very effective method. So it, it really depends. Uh, I, I think a combination of uh, uh, ultrasonic testing uh, might be able to uh, to at least provide some sort of information about the structural integrity in these type of columns. Thank you. We do have quite a few more questions here. Uh, does ASR have direct effect on NDT testing? That's a very good question. Uh, like my business partner, Dr. Uh, Moradi, is basically like his entire PhD thesis has been on this topic, uh, developing novel NDT solutions, which is a like nonlinear acoustic method for evaluation of uh, ASR uh, induced cracks in concrete. So uh, ASR cracks at early stage, they are like very tiny. So you might not be able to find them with linear acoustics. So you really need uh, acoustic, uh, non-linear non acoustic method. So in those methods, uh, a huge source of impact is used to open up the cracks. And at the same time, uh, ultrasonic is performed. Uh, that is where you can actually evaluate uh, those cracks. But now if you have advanced ASR, where those cracks are filled with, uh, with with the gel, uh, then I would say NDT will be much more difficult and uh, you, you may end up like having the standard petrographic test uh, to evaluate those concrete elements. Okay, uh, maybe we just do one more question before our quiz. Um, uh, any thoughts on whether electrical resistivity could be used to compare the quality, density, abrasion resistance of industrial floor slabs, if not uh, any over uh, NDT options? Uh, yes, uh, like uh, from my, like I've, I've done a lot of research on this myself, like uh, uh, from my perspective, yes, uh, and, uh, but, but we still, I guess, uh, the code is a little bit behind. The guidelines are a little bit behind in this. Uh, like, like there is a there is a continuous like uh, conversation among researchers and engineers on which uh, which NDT method is uh, better for this. Uh, I definitely go with uh, surface electrical resistivity. Uh, but uh, when when doing surface electrical resistivity in the field, uh, we also have to uh, keep in mind that it is uh, it can be affected by uh, moisture content and also the presence of a steel rebar. So those two elements can uh, can impact the accuracy and precision of the results. But if done by a competent engineer and uh, by recording all the uh, variations and like uh, parameters that could affect the test results. I think uh, surface electrical resistivity should have a good chance in uh, providing uh, information about this. And uh, you can always like calibrate these test results with, uh, with other methods, like uh, with the uh, minimum number of cores that are taken and uh, you do other tests and then uh, uh, cross correlate uh, field results to the lab results. And in this way, at least you have uh, reduced the number of intrusive tests in the mess. So my, my message for today's presentation is basically NDT. I'm not here to say NDT replaces like uh, the standard procedures. I'm here to say NDT complements those tests and also uh, gives you a chance to minimize the number of intrusive tests. So you, if you're a contractor that needs to do uh, things slightly modern and better, uh, I would certainly recommend doing NDT and surface electrical resistivity is certainly is one of the best methods there. Thank you so much, Hamed. We do have a few more questions, but uh, to respect the time, uh, we're going to forward the question to you. Maybe you can, uh, we can address those questions uh, uh, after this event. Now I'm just going to turn back to Camille uh, for the quiz portion. Thank you. You're very welcome, sir. Okay, excellent. That was a fantastic presentation and I'm sure everybody learned a lot. We're actually going to find out exactly how much you were paying attention as we get into our pop quiz little game show round here. Uh, so if everyone could please use their smartphone to go to the website on the screen, www.kahoot.it. 
This will allow you to log into the game. You don't have to download any apps or anything like that. Quick and easy, I promise. And then from there, we're gonna have a pin that will be shown on the screen shortly. So you'll just be entering that in to, to reach our game. Uh, enter both your email address and a nickname. So we need your email address so that way whoever finishes in the top three, we've got some prizes to email out to you after. Uh, and for your nickname, just please keep your HR department in, my, in mind. Let's not use anything that, uh, that you're going to regret afterwards. And the faster you answer each question, the more points you can earn for correct answers. So it is, uh, it is all about timing. You do want to try and get your answers in as quickly as possible. So our uh, prizes today are going to be some Amazon gift cards. Um, I mean, it's nice and easy for us to get them out to you. And I think something that everyone can use uh, while we're all locked down. Uh, at home during the pandemic. So we've got $150 for first place, $100 for second place, and $50 for third place. So hopefully that will provide a little bit of extra motivation and get everyone participating. So I'm just gonna bring up our screen now, one moment. Okay, so this is the pin that is on the screen here now, 7500467. And uh, once I see that we've got some players logged in, we will start this game. of concrete related nicknames surprise surprise looks like we've got 14 participants so far we'll give it another moment and we'll get started <laughs> can be used for quality control testing. All right, just about everybody got that one right, so we're off to a good start. Hey, BRPHM is our number one, uh, number one spot right now. Which NDT method is better for estimating concrete strength? All right, the rebound hammer. Looks like everybody got that one. Our music seems to have cut out on us. Hopefully we will get that back shortly. And we still have our same top three. Which method is good for evaluating concrete cracks? All right, you guys are nice and fast. So 11 people got that one. Oh, and we've uh, got a new number one. All right. NDT cannot help concrete contractors and it does not have any value. True or false.
All right, everybody got that one. I mean, that was pretty much a giveaway, but oh, we've got a new fastest time, it looks like, and our music is back. Which method can be used to verify steel rebar spacing in concrete walls and floors? number one spot still. What is the best way to estimate in place concrete strength? Ooh, this one was a little bit more challenging. Five correct answers and that changes our standings. Always concrete is sneaking in there. Rebound hammer result, results are 100% accurate and do not need calibration. True or false? All right, I was quick on that one. Always concrete is on a hot streak, apparently. True or false? Using a rebound hammer will damage the concrete surface. questions left. Which test method is best for evaluating concrete piles and shafts? Okay. All right, standings still seem to be the same. Last one, true or false? Extracting concrete cores answers all questions regarding concrete durability and strength. And here are our final podium results. So we have Andre in third place, uh, BR Femme in second, and Minerva, Minerva, Minervara, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, in first place. So we have our top three. Thank you so much for playing, everybody. It's nice to have something a little bit more interactive as part of our uh, presentation today. So I should have your email addresses through uh, Cahoots, and I will be emailing out some gift cards to you later today. And pretty much wraps us up for today. I do just want to remind everybody that our next associate member webinar is going to be on February 11th, same time from 10 a.m. to 11. And we will have TechWill joining us, and they will be presenting on greening concrete production for improved profitability. And I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today, hopefully from the comforts of your home offices or living rooms. Uh, and thank you again to Hamid for putting on an excellent presentation for us. Uh, this has been a great way for us to connect and share some valuable industry information during a time where we can't meet in person, unfortunately. We hope to see you all again at our next webinar in February as we continue our new associate member webinar series. And we hope you all stay healthy and safe. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.